y'all. So this is my first foray into a full length, I guess, true crime video, a deep dive into a case. When I started this channel, I never intended to make any true crime content, but it seems like that's the content that people are most attracted to now. So if you haven't met me before, my name is Lisa. I make a lot of maternal mental health content on this channel, particularly pertaining to postpartum and new mom stuff in general and pregnancy. So if you haven't checked those videos out, feel free to take a look at those. When I was living in New York years ago, I remember when this case broke and it was very disturbing. We would see updates every morning on the local news and something about it never quite sat right with me or the people that I spoke to about it. It all felt very strange, um, not throwing shade to the family because it's so tragic. They were all so close. Um, but the family's close ties to the NYPD, that neighborhood in particular, and some history with that neighborhood, the suspect seeming to have no motive or real criminal history, all of it felt very, very weird. So this is my first attempt into doing a deep dive on this case. If you like it, please feel free to like and subscribe and return for more. I'll just get into it now. Our story takes place in Queens, New York, where Phil Vetrano was a well-respected member of his community. He was a retired firefighter and a first responder on 9-11. He was regarded by many as a hero, especially by his family. He and his wife, Kathy, had three children, including their beautiful daughter, Karina. Karina Ann Vetrano was born in Howard Beach, Queens, across the East River from Manhattan on July 12, 1986. Howard Beach is a lovely neighborhood, predominantly made up of Italian-Americans. It's a really tight-knit community. However, this neighborhood also has a dark underbelly and has been the subject of a lot of controversy over the years. One of Howard Beach's infamous claims to fame is John Gotti. As you probably know, Gotti was one of the most infamous gangsters of all time. Howard Beach is where he lived and raised his family for several years. This area is also infamous for its racial tension, such as in the case of Michael Griffith. In December 1986, four African-American men were traveling between Brooklyn and Queens when their car broke down near Howard Beach. Three of the men walked to find a payphone while the fourth stayed with the vehicle. The men were accosted by a group of white residents as soon as they entered Howard Beach. They hurled racial slurs at them, told them to leave the neighborhood. The young men ignored them and continued towards the local pizza place, where a group of white men was waiting for them, armed with tire irons, baseball bats, and tree branches. After being severely beaten, Michael Griffith fled his attackers and ran onto the Belt Parkway, where he was struck and killed by a vehicle. In connection with Michael Griffith's death, nine people were found guilty of various charges. Howard Beach, however, has worked hard to leave behind its negative reputation in recent years and is now considered a safe haven from the bustling city. Sadly, the safety that residents of Howard Beach had grown accustomed to was shattered when Karina Vetrano disappeared while out for a jog in the summer of 2016. Keeping in shape was really important to Phil and Karina. Karina asked Phil if he would like to join her for their usual jog on August 2nd, 2016. However, that day, Phil told Karina he wasn't feeling well. He was suffering from back pain, so he decided to rest at home. Phil didn't want Karina to run alone, so he asked her to stay back. But it was a gorgeous day, and Karina wasn't about to skip it. When Karina was young, she had leg surgery and was told she may never run again. But instead, she became an avid runner and could be found jogging nearly every day. Around 5 p.m., Karina entered Spring Creek Park. 
Karina's parents lived about a block from Spring Creek Park, which straddles the border between Brooklyn and Queens. It's primarily a muddy forest area around Howard Beach, with only a tiny portion accessible to the public. It was a prime running location, but the park is super desolate and has a lot of transients and homeless people in it. But Karina was familiar with it, having run in the park several times before, so she was not concerned about it. When Karina did not return when she said she would, Phil Vetrano became concerned. He reached out to a friend who was a police officer with the NYPD, and together they launched an official search for Karina. Phil was familiar with his daughter's running route and helped the police in their pursuit. Tragically, the search for Karina ended only a few hours after it began. Only feet from the jogging path, Phil found his daughter face down in the marsh. Upon hearing Phil's screams, police found his bloodied and scratched daughter's body beside him. She had clearly been assaulted. It was obvious that the officers were too late to help Karina. In an autopsy performed on Karina's body, the medical examiner determined her cause of death was strangulation and that she had also been sexually assaulted. His ruling was that the death was a homicide. In addition to her family, Karina's murder affected the entire community. Residents poured out in droves to honor one of their own. Without their daughter, Phil and Kathy were distraught. More than sad, they were furious. Dressed the killer himself. Uh, I know that you're tormented. I know that you are being, that you're being driven crazy. I know that you want to do the right thing. And I'm telling you right now, we are very, very close. Please, you turn yourself in. I, I guarantee you that money, that reward money, will go to a member of your family of your choice. That is my word. I guarantee that. And I also promise you that if you turn yourself in, we will go easier on you. I, I would recommend that. So please, this is your last chance for that because it is coming and it is coming very soon. Thank you. Despite the odds being against them, the NYPD and the Vetrano family continued their search for Karina's murderer. Posters were hung, news media appearances were made, and they even canvassed door to door. When police set up a tip line, locals quickly donated over $100,000 for information. Howard Beach residents said they don't sit back and allow others to handle their business in response to the reward fund. Fortunately, investigators had DNA evidence to work with in Karina's case. However, if investigators could not match in CODIS, the FBI's national DNA database, the DNA would be meaningless. The DNA of an unknown male was discovered on Karina's cell phone and on her body. Six months after her murder, the killer was caught. After matching his DNA with that found at the crime scene, NYPD officers arrested Channel Lewis. Channel, who was unemployed, lived with his mother in a low-income housing project in East New York, near the park where Karina was killed. Several phone calls about a man acting suspiciously in Spring Creek Park brought him to the attention of investigators. An investigator in Karina's case requested Channel's DNA sample on a hunch, and Channel volunteered one. During his confession, he also described a strange puddle of muddy water that detectives had seen near Vetrano's body. Investigators believed that those items were information that only the killer would know. Despite having no criminal record, he allegedly had a hatred for women and once told a teacher's aide that he wanted to, quote, stab all the girls at his school. Law enforcement had taken Channel into protective custody several times. Channel was considered mentally unstable and reclusive. After investigators told him Channel's DNA matched the crime scene DNA, Channel confessed. However, Channel's defense team has raised concerns about his alleged confession. When he confessed 
first to detectives on February 5th, he misidentified what Karina had on and refused to admit he sexually assaulted her. Channel pled not guilty to murder, denying all involvement in Karina's death. Well, it was a night of high drama and tensions released as those guilty verdicts came pouring in for the Vetrano family who waited three agonizing years to hear those words. They basically erupted into a standing ovation. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty. Yeah. The courtroom broke out in tears and screams and applause when the jury came back with guilty verdicts on all four counts. The four men reading loud and clear that they believe 22-year-old Channel Lewis murdered and sexually abused 30-year-old Karina Vetrano, whose only crime was going for a jog. Her parents leaving court tonight feeling like their prayers have finally been answered. Say it again. Thank you, Jesus. Jubilation. Justice. Justice. It was a hot August day in Howard Beach. Karina Vetrano went out for a run but never came home. They eventually found her battered body deep in the park. It took three years and two trials to reach this moment of justice. The first trial ended in a hung jury in November when five jurors refused to believe that all the DNA evidence collected and two taped confessions were enough. This time, prosecutors packed their case with forensic evidence and emotions as both parents testified about having their beloved daughter return to them in a casket. This is what she looked like an hour before the defendant got his hands on her. And this is what she looked like after. It brought at least one juror to tears five hours later, guilty on all counts. We the jury final defendant. The defense attorney tried to argue that Lewis's DNA found in the victim's fingernails, neck, and cell phone did not make sense. Police arrest the right person responsible. He choked her and choked her and choked her. Now going forward, sentencing is scheduled for April 17th. Channel Lewis could face life in prison without parole. His attorney tonight calling this a miscarriage of justice and vowing to appeal. Following the final ruling, Lewis maintained that he was innocent. Several news outlets surrounding the case argued Channel was innocent as well. They said the verdict and prison sentence was a racially motivated decision. There have also been allegations of possible tampering with the DNA evidence. Howard Beach's history with race only makes the facts of the case muddier. Furthermore, the news reported that the judge refused to proceed with the case until the juror retracted his conclusion that the defendant was innocent. A number of opponents of the ruling compared the incident to a lynching in their argument. Channel supporters asked the district attorney of Queens to review Channel's case in 2021. In their opinion, the case was railroaded, and he did not receive a fair trial. The Queens District Attorney created the Conviction Integrity Unit in 2020 with the purpose of reviewing past convictions with reliable evidence of innocence. Her office declined to comment on the case. There was no comment from the Vetrano family as well. As of now, that is where Karina's case stands. Karina's alma mater, Archbishop Malloy High School, established a memorial scholarship in her honor. Young women who demonstrate Karina's positive attitude upon entering the school are eligible for scholarships. So let me know what you guys think. Um, the things that I found weird was like I mentioned before that this guy was just a random guy. He didn't know Karina. He lived in the neighborhood like next door to this area, but he wasn't like some homeless vagrant in the park that was like living there all the time, saw Karina all the time. Um, he wasn't an acquaintance or anyone that she'd ever encountered before as far as we know. Um, he didn't have much of a criminal past. I know that he was somewhat troubled, but um, also that quote from his teacher that he wanted to like kill all women, I feel like is something that's so easily taken out of context. Like adolescents say the craziest things. 
But this, to me, is the weirdest thing. So on the evening that the defense rested their case, they returned to their offices and they found a plain envelope with a three-page letter inside of it. It contained an anonymous letter allegedly from an NYPD officer alerting the defense attorneys to exculpatory evidence. The person who wrote it said that he, that this had been withheld from the defense. And they said that during the first two weeks of the probe, there were two jacked up looking white guys from Howard Beach that were the suspects. And they sort of just dropped from the investigation. This isn't necessarily the strangest things, right? Like suspects come and go, they get vetted. But it seems to me, based on this letter, that they weren't entirely found to have an alibi or there wasn't really just cause to stop looking into these guys, essentially. And yeah, so let me know what you think. Let me know what you think about the presentation of this video. Um, I mostly did it in a more immersive way, but do you guys like it when it's more like talking through it like we are now? But let me know in the comments and I hope you enjoyed and I'll see y'all soon.